Suddenly, it was bright, and she recoiled. You could be seen in the light. It was harder to hide in the light. Her body curled around itself. The warm wetness surrounding her said safety, but the bright light made her fear. Chaotic dream images flickered across her faltering consciousness. The cold comfort of cryosleep. The driving need to protect her young. The strength and companionship of her own kind. The power of her own rage. The warmth and safety of the steaming crash. The images were meaningless and meaningful at the same time. She recognized them on a level far beyond consciousness, far beyond learning. They were a part of her, part of who she'd been, what she'd been, and now they were a part of what she was becoming. She floated in the gelatinous, comforting warmth, trying to hide from the light and the sounds, murmuring distant sounds that were outside of her, inside of her. They came and went, the sounds, meaning nothing, meaning everything. She heard the inside sounds again, one so much stronger than the others, the one she always listened to, the one she tried so hard to remember. She heard it whisper. My mommy always said there were no monsters, no real ones, but there are. If only she knew what that meant. Perhaps someday. So are the words of the Alien Resurrection novelization by A.C. Crispin, describing the first thoughts that befall an embryonic Ripley 8 gestating inside the Ariga's lab. Ripley 8, the clone of Ellen Ripley, experienced what Dr. Gediman described as an unexpected benefit of the genetic drift, collective memory, passed down generationally at a genetic level by the aliens, almost like a highly evolved form of instinct perhaps a survival mechanism to keep them unified, keep their species intact, regardless of the differing characteristics they may have to adopt from their varied hosts. But how much does Ripley 8 remember of her past life? In the originally released film version of Alien Resurrection, there is a vague notion that the clone has memories of once being Ellen Ripley 200 years prior, but there are no specific references to what those memories may be. The special edition version of the film, however, includes some scenes previously deleted that hold clues as to what Ripley 8 remembers. These were scenes included in an earlier draft of Joss Whedon's screenplay, which included all of the moments restored in the special edition version and plenty more that differently shaped the film, and differently shaped Ripley 8's struggle with remembering her original life. These struggles may be best retained in the novelization, based on that earlier screenplay, which has the benefits of outright describing Ripley's thoughts and the dreams that haunt her intermittently throughout the story. With the special edition version, the earlier screenplay, and the novelization, we get a better idea of what Ripley 8 remembers, how and why she remembers what she does, and how it all contributes to the character's arc. While Ripley 8 is not the Ripley we all know and love from the original three movies, she remains a fascinating character all on her own, enhanced all the more by what was actually left out of the film. In this video, I'll be looking at scenes from the script, novelization, and special edition, piecing together the lost memories of the lost memories and the struggle of Ripley 8 that mostly went on in her own mind. In one of the special edition's most telling scenes during Ripley's assessment, she is shown an image of a little girl and reacts emotionally. More than likely, this image provokes the memories of Newt, and the novelization confirms this, taking it even a step further, adding that Ripley is also shown an image that reminds her of Jonesy. Wren was clearly uncomfortable with Perez's lack of enthusiasm. He wiped a bit of dirt off the video screen as the doctor working with the host held up the picture of a big orange cat. She looked at it, hesitated, then looked away, frowning, as if searching her memory. That's interesting, Perez thought, wondering why that particular image. She's freaked, Gediman decided. The scientist in the room with Ripley gave up on the cat picture and pulled up a different one. It was a simple cartoon-like drawing of a little girl with blonde hair. The restrained woman's body suddenly stiffened, the bored expression vanished, and her face changed, grew attentive. She stared at the picture, clearly surprised, then her brow furrowed, her eyes softened. For a moment, it almost looked as if she might cry. The change was startling, and revealed for a moment her true humanity. Even the scientist in the room was taken aback and sat silent, no longer prodding her with the spelling of the word he wanted. 
For a moment, none of them said anything. None of them could. The cartoonish picture of the child wavered before her eyes as her body jerked upright in the restraints. Her child. Her young. No. Not hers. Yes, mine. My young. The picture meant everything and nothing all at the same time. Her mind swam with tumbled, chaotic scenes and memories she could not sort out. The steaming warmth of the crash, the strength and safety of her own kind, the aloneness of individuality, and the driving need to find… Small, strong arms wrapped around her neck, small, strong legs wrapped around her waist. There was chaos, and she was that chaos. The warriors screamed and died. There was fire. I knew you would come. The sweeping pain of loss, sickening, irretrievable loss, flooded her mind, her entire body. Her eyes filled with liquid until she could not see, then emptied, clearing her vision, then filled again. It meant nothing. It meant everything. Mommy. She searched for the connection to her own kind. She searched to find the strength and safety of the crash, but it was not there. And in its place was nothing but this pain, this terrible loss. She was hollow, empty, as she would ever be. In an additional dialogue exchange during Ripley's conversation with Dr. Gediman, it's revealed that Ripley also holds memories of her fate and the fate of her friends on the prison planet of Fury 161. While the planet is mentioned in both versions of the film and in the novelization, this moment is exclusive to the screenplay and gives some further insight into Ripley 8's memories of what happened in the previous film. Notably, it is referred to Fury 16 instead of Fury 161. The screenplay portrays the following. Ripley, how did you get him in? How did we get you? Blood samples taken on Fury 16, on ice. Ripley. Fury 16. Gediman. Ring a bell? What do you remember about that place? She thinks and puts her hand to her hair, almost as if to check it's there. Thinks some more. Ripley. Came down in the shuttle. It was cold. They didn't make it. They didn't survive. Gediman. Who? She thinks hard, but the names don't come. Ripley. I can see their faces, but... There's a girl. Gediman. What else? Ripley. The cold... And... Touches her chest. The pain... With a few small exceptions of dialogue, this scene continues to play out as it does in the final film. During the initial encounter between Ripley 8 and Call, there is some additional dialogue that is preserved in the script and the novelization, but absent from the final film and its special edition. It includes a reference to the previous film and a single enigmatic line of dialogue from Ripley 8. This is how the scene plays out in the script version. Ripley pushes her hand out. The blade goes right through her palm. She keeps pushing her hand out slowly, a good five inches of the blade sticking out the back of her hand before she stops. Call stares at her. Call. What are you? Ripley. Ripley Ellen, Lieutenant First Class, number 36706. Call. Ellen Ripley died 200 years ago. Ripley. What do you know about it? Call. I've read Morse. I've read all the banned histories. She gave her life to protect us from the beast. You're not her. Ripley. I'm not her. What am I? Call. You're a thing. A construct. They grew you in a fucking lab. Ripley. But only God can make a tree. Call. And now they've brought the beast out of you. Ripley. Smiling. Not all the way. The rest of the scene plays out as we see it in the film, but the additional information left out is quite interesting. Call mentions having read Morse, a reference to the lone surviving prisoner of Fury 161 who went on to write his account Space Beast about his experiences with Ripley and the alien. 
There's also apparently more writings about the Xenomorph that have been banned since Ripley's time. The most curious of the removed dialogue is Ripley's line, But only God can make a tree. This is the final line of a poem written by author Joyce Kilmer in 1913. The poem, Trees, became well known over the years, often a favorite for Arbor Day celebrations and renowned for its simplicity and imagery. I think that I shall never see a poem as lovely as a tree, a tree whose hungry mouth is pressed against the earth's sweet flowing breast, a tree that looks at God all day and lifts her leafy arms to pray, a tree that may in summer wear a nest of robins in her hair. Upon whose bosom snow has lain, who intimately lives with rain. Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. Unless one of the scientists aboard the Auriga taught this to her, which is possible, then this poem, or at least its final line, must have come from Ellen Ripley's human memories. While the clone echoes it in an ironic, foreboding way to call, maybe this was something Ripley knew from her youth, or learned from school. Maybe it was something that held some kind of significance to her, enough to commit to memory. Perhaps a quiet affirmation she'd repeat to herself during the long months and years out in the coldness of space, reminding her of the natural beauty that awaits her back on Earth. The introduction of Annalee Call becomes a key factor in the further memories that Ripley 8 is able to bring to light. Call, in many ways, reminds the clone of the person, the human, Ripley used to be. Idealistic, determined, altruistic. After their first meeting, while Ripley is alone in her cell, a flood of memories takes over. The novelization describes this event. Ripley curled up tight within her shadow and stared into the darkness, trying not to let the young woman's words touch her. She was tired, so very tired, but she didn't dare sleep. I don't want to sleep, a small, thin voice said in her head. I have scary dreams. Who said that? Ripley couldn't remember, but the memory stabbed like a knife. She couldn't sleep. She felt as if they could touch her in her sleep. Her mind was unguarded then, and brought them to the surface. All the monsters. The real monsters. Moving. Breathing. Seething. Dreaming. Planning. Waiting. She shuddered. They were a perfect organism, with only one true function. And that woman, that small young woman, she couldn't understand. Its structural perfection is matched only by its hostility. Ripley could not recall who said that to her or when, but she remembered it nonetheless. It filled her with a crushing sadness. The thought of that idealistic young woman's zeal, her determination, depressed her even more. For Ripley could see the barest shadow of what she had been in that woman's eyes. What fate and the universe's worst luck had made her. And what has fate made me now? She wondered hollowly. She didn't know. Had it made her Ellen Ripley, as her chaotic mind insisted? Or had it made her a quizzling, a changeling, as grotesque as... as... I prefer to be called an artificial person. She blinked, looking at the rapidly healing mark on her palm, all that was left from the woman's knife. In the stillness of that moment, her eyes dropped, her body sagged, and she slipped into sleep unawares. And then it was there, waiting for her, behind her eyes. She jerked out of the nightmare with a cry. Wake up. Be quiet. We're in trouble. No, that was just a memory. She paused, listening, watching in the dark, sensing. No. Not just a memory, not just a bad dream. Something was happening. Something real. During the aliens' escape aboard the Auriga and their pursuit of Ripley, the novelization describes further jumbled memories that come together and eventually give Ripley the idea of how to escape from her cell. This is what it describes. The door to her cell buckled as the creatures battered and bashed at it. It could not hold much longer. Ripley looked around the cell, trying to find something, anything, that might help her. She glanced above, realizing she had not seen the guard for a long time. Dimly, she could hear the computer voice urging evacuation. It seemed like a good idea, but how? She remembered something. Try to break the glass. Hurry. There was no glass to break. They cut the power. How could they cut the power? 
They're animals. Her eyes searched the cell, found the cables encased in metal, followed them to a metal housing sealed into the wall. Cut the power. She punched at the housing with her fist as hard as she could, bashing it the same way the aliens were bashing in her door, trying to get her. She hit it again, again, again. It bent, buckled, started to twist. She worked harder, hit harder, all the while feverishly glancing at her failing door. Finally, she could get her fingertips under a small tear in the metal. She pulled at it, twisting, tugging until the metal yielded, and she yanked it away from the electrical circuits inside. Jabbing the side of her hand against the sharp edges of the torn metal, she cut herself badly. Holding her injured hand, she forced more blood out, dripping it onto the main circuits and cables she'd revealed. Almost instantly, it started to melt. There was a sudden burst of sparks, making her jump back. The cell was plunged into darkness as the lights went out, but Ripley could still see. Then there was a whoosh, and an emergency exit opened in the wall of her cell. With final glance back at the damaged door, Ripley left the cell. Also described in the novelization only, further memories fled to Ripley later on once called a shot and supposedly killed by Dr. Wren as Ripley witnesses the event. Ripley watched Call fall past her and went numb with shock, then felt surprised that she felt that way. She watched as Call's body hit the water and went under, watched as the other woman sank to the bottom, watched as Call drifted right by the shadow of the alien still beneath the surface of the pool. Something was tugging at the recesses of her mind. Something. A little blonde girl, walking in waist-deep water, calling her name. Ripley. Ripley. Racing to save the girl, racing against time and monsters. I'm coming. Hold on, I'm coming. But when she got there, to the water, there was nothing. Nothing but a plastic doll head sinking under the waves, just like Call was sinking. And she was sobbing, screaming. I've got to save her. They won't kill her. You've got to understand, they won't kill her. She remembered sobbing. She remembered feeling so strong they tore at her. Feelings like those she'd had in the lab when she saw her sisters. She watched Call's disappearing body, remembering a plastic doll's head disappearing below the waves. In a moment that exists in the screenplay, the novelization, and restored for the special edition, there is additional dialogue in the chapel scene after Call infiltrates the Ariga's computers. Ripley and Call discuss why they feel it's so important to destroy the aliens and to save humanity. Call says, I couldn't watch them do it. I couldn't watch them annihilate themselves. Do you understand that? Ripley replies. I did once. I tried to save people. It didn't work out. There was this girl. She had bad dreams. I tried to help her. She died. Now I can't even remember her name. This is the last we hear of the matter in any version of the film, however it is explored further in the novelization. Ripley does eventually come to remember the name of the little girl she tried to save. Once she is captured by the aliens and brought to the Queen, it comes to her in a sequence of more scattered memories. Wake up. Be quiet. We're in trouble. She paused, listening, sensing. Something was happening. Not a dream, something real. Ripley lay still in the arms of the beast. The light was minimal, but that did not hamper her. She breathed quietly, absorbing the breath of the creature. The warm wetness around her said safety, but chaotic dream images flickered across her faltering consciousness. The cold comfort of cryosleep, the driving need to protect her young the strength and companionship of her own kind, the power of her own rage, the warmth and safety of the steaming crash. The images were meaningless and meaningful at the same time. She recognized them on a level beyond consciousness, beyond learning. They were a part of her, part of who she'd been, what she'd been, and now they were part of what she was becoming. She floated in the humid, comforting warmth, wanting to hide. There were murmuring distant sounds that were outside of her, inside of her. They came and went the sounds, meaning nothing, meaning everything. Distantly, she could sense the queen and her terrible need. 
Then she heard the inside sounds again, one stronger than the others, the one she always listened to, the one she tried so hard to remember. It whispered. My mommy always said there were no monsters, no real ones, but there are. That sound insisted she wake, but once she woke, the dreams would all become real. She was tired, so very tired, but when she slept... I don't want to sleep, the tiny voice said. I have scary dreams. They touched her in her sleep. All the monsters, the real monsters. Moving, breathing, seething, dreaming, planning. She shuddered. They were a perfect organism with only one true function. Its structural perfection is matched only by its hostility. She moaned softly, despondently. An idealistic young woman had shown her the shadow of what she had once been, what fate had made her. But what was she now? Was she Ellen Ripley, or a changeling as grotesque as… as… At least there's a part of you that's human. I'm just… I'm just… I prefer to be called an artificial person. Slowly, she registered a dim sensation, something outside herself, something happening to herself. Her eyes moved around as she gathered information. Her terrible children had finally come for her. They were everywhere, carrying her, welcoming her. But the others were gone, the humans, those she'd fought so long and so hard to protect to save. She'd been separated from them, taken from them. Part of her felt enormous relief. Part of her felt tremendous rage. She facilitated between feelings as she lay in the arms of the beast. A cartoonish picture of a blonde child wavered in her mind, gradually replaced by a clearer image of a real child. Her child? No, not hers. Yes, mine. Her mind swam with chaotic memories. The steaming warmth of the crash, the strength and safety of her own kind, the aloneness of individuality, and the driving need to find small strong arms wrapped around her neck, small strong legs wrapped around her waist. There was chaos. The warriors screamed and died. There was fire. I knew you would come. She blinked, confused, her mind a sudden shambles of fragments, memories, instincts she could not sort out. The sweeping pain of loss, sickening, irretrievable loss, flooded her mind, her entire body. It meant nothing. It meant everything. Newt. My name is Newt. No one calls me Rebecca. I'm coming, Newt. I'm coming. Mommy. Ripley searched for the connection to her own kind. She searched to find the strength and safety of the creche, but it was not there. And in its place was nothing but this pain, this terrible loss. She was hollow, empty. Dimly, she looked at the huge warrior holding her and longed to ask him the same question she had asked the others, the humans. The question no one would ever answer. Why? Why? As the memories of Nude's voice ricocheted around her brain, she determined she would have the answer. She would take it from them, in spite of their size, their strength, in spite of their ferocity and hostility. She would take it by force. When brought to the cocoon chambers of the Ariga, Ripley 8 also remembers what she had seen inside the colony of LV-426 during the events of Aliens. The novelization describes the following. Their arms and hands and legs were all fastened down, glued with ropes of exudate to the walls of the huge cylindrical room. Vaguely, she remembered Call's mechanical voice saying something about activity in a waste tank and wished she'd paid more attention. The eight people she could see were all trapped against the walls of the circular tank. Soldiers, researchers, all stuck like giant flies, half cocooned. She remembered a similar scene. All the colonists from Hadley's Hope, cocooned to the wall, growing chestbursters. Most of them had emerged, but everyone here is still intact. Frantically, Ripley tried to figure out a way to escape from the waste tank, but from where she knelt she could see no doors, no exits of any kind. They'd gotten her in here. There had to be a way out. In what might be the most interesting 
of the additions that peer into Ripley 8's mind throughout the novelization is during the birth of the newborn alien. Sharing a mental link with the Queen and feeling her pain, Ripley 8 remembers the birth of her own daughter, Amanda, and laments her loss all over again. The Queen was thrashing more wildly, shrieking steadily. The other aliens were more and more agitated, humming, twittering, darting through the muck. One particular cry from the Queen was especially piercing, and Ripley froze in place. The Queen's belly heaved, alive, something clearly writhing inside it. Ripley tensed as a memory surfaced. This happened to me. I gave birth. I was a mother once. A real mother. I lay in my own bed, and my husband was there. And a nurse, and doctor. I cried out as my belly heaved. She could feel it now. The memory was that strong. Instinctively, her hands rubbed her own belly. I was sweating hard, but I didn't want drugs, even when my husband begged me to take them. I was worried about all those years of cryodrugs, and wouldn't take anything as I delivered. In my own bed. My own home. She watched the Queen thrash and scream in the slime and the muck and this travesty, this obscene parody of her own experience, made her sick. I had a girl. A beautiful little girl. She looked like both her parents. We called her Amy. Ellen Ripley blinked at the flood of human memories crashing in on her while she remained trapped here in alien hell. You told Amy you'd be back for her 11th birthday. You promised. That was the first time you defeated them. But your escape pod wasn't found for 57 years. Amy died never knowing why you didn't come home for her birthday. Ripley closed her eyes for a moment, her daughter's face clear before her. Other memories surged up. Newt. Hicks. Even Jonesy. All of them gone lost to the years. When the newborn is aboard the Betty, essentially holding Call hostage, the novelization depicts more memories of the events of Aliens and her android companion's fate. More memories of Newt also come to light, and a strange realization that both the newborn and Newt were her surrogate children. As the newborn hissed and screeched and clutched the terrified call to its body, Ripley realized that the only way she could kill it now would be to do as Call had wanted, to snatch up to Stefano's gun and shoot the monster repeatedly through the robot's body. But Ripley could no sooner do that than she could have done it to Newt. No, shooting the beast was clearly not the answer. But what was the answer? It was true, Call was only a robot, but the whole purpose of the original robot program was to use the androids in places that were too dangerous for human beings. The only reason they existed was to save the lives of real people. Through the years came the whispered memory. I prefer the term artificial person. I can't lie to you about your chances, but you have my sympathy. Bishop and Ash, only robots. One nearly sacrificed his own life to save her and the child. The other would have happily killed her for interfering with his plans. Ripley closed her eyes as the crowded, conflicted memories chattered so loudly in her mind she couldn't think. Ripley had a sudden, shocking memory of Bishop being torn in half by an enraged queen and knew that the newborn could just as easily damage Call. Ripley had not been able to save Bishop then. And since Call was the only one of her kind in this time period, she would be unable to salvage Call either. She had to do something. Wasn't that always her fate? With a sigh of despair, Ripley held her hands out in a gesture of surrender. Ripley forced herself to once again search for the telepathic contact she'd felt back in the crash. There's something tenuous, guarded, but something. I feel it. It was inhuman, repellent, but somehow familiar. It was everything Ripley could do not to shudder. She made herself meet the creature's gaze, meet the eyes that were exactly her color. The contact was cold, but hungry, enraged, yet achingly lonely. The creche was destroyed, all the others gone. The newborn was truly alone now. The only one left that had even some small spark of connection to it was the human woman standing before it. She held her hands out in supplication and filled her mind with comforting thoughts, with the connectedness that had once existed between them. Mentally, she saw the image of herself holding Newt, 
small, blonde, trusting Newt. She saw the child's arms and legs entwined around her, clinging, knowing Ripley wouldn't let her go, wouldn't release her. Newt, who understood with the child's unshakable trust that Ripley would come back for her. She held the image in her mind as she murmured, Come on. Yes. Suddenly, in her mind, the image of herself holding Newt safely in her arms changed. There were memories of unexpected chaos, warriors screaming and dying, and fire. And herself, Ripley, standing firm, holding her own young in her arms, causing death and destruction to the crash. Finally, once the newborn was killed and the Betty began its safe passage to Earth, Ripley has a final sequence of memories, but they are changed and resolved now. The closing moments of the Alien Resurrection novelization describe the following. Ripley stared out of the Betty's viewport at the approaching Earth. She'd never seen a blue sky or real soil, at least not in this incarnation. It was new to her, and she enjoyed the uniqueness of it. She sensed Call standing quietly at her shoulder, and the robot's presence gave her a sense of comfort and companionship that she had never felt before. The memories of Newt, and Amy, Hicks, and Bishop, and all the other people whose lives she'd touched no longer burned so painfully inside her. Now they made her feel warm. They made her feel human. She had loved and been loved. She had fought and protected and had died to save those she loved. She would do it again, if need be. And again. And again. She was okay with it now. The dream images that had so long flickered across her mind were no longer chaotic. The cold comfort of cryosleep, the driving need to protect her young, the strength and companionship of her own kind, the power of her own rage, the warmth and safety of the company of friends. The images were meaningful, satisfying. She recognized them on a level far beyond consciousness, far beyond learning. They were part of her, part of who she'd been, what she'd been, and now they were a part of what she had become. While the special edition of Alien Resurrection restores a fair amount of previously unseen footage cut from the original film, and Joss Whedon's earlier screenplay has a wide variety of details that didn't make it, it's the novelization that stands as a completely different beast. While the novelization broke the proud tradition of having Alan Dean Foster adapt the films into books, A.C. Crispin's contributions are more than worthy. It's a faithful adaptation of the original screenplay, and its additions provide an entirely different angle to the Ripley character by getting deep inside her head and really driving home the conflict that she feels throughout the story. But could these details have worked in the actual movie? either through dialogue or flashbacks, or was it best left just a little ambiguous? And I'm curious, for those who appreciate the film, or at least are open to giving it another chance and viewing it every so often, which version of the film do you prefer? The actual cut or the special edition? Comment below and let me know what you think. And as always, I'd like to thank you very much for watching today. I really appreciate it. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to give it a like, and you can also subscribe for all the latest videos from the channel. A very, very special thanks goes out to Wayland Utani executives Emmerich, Mark Fox, and in the Ellen Ripley tier of excellence, Lady Am. My thanks also goes out to the Hive Queens, Ronnie Jensen, Alice Ayn, and Jackson Roche. All part of the Patreon Hive, the Warm Crash. If you'd like to join the Hive and support the channel, check out my Patreon page for exclusive posts and contests. In the meantime, you can catch up with Alien Theory over social media. Follow at Alien underscore Theory on Twitter and at Alien Theory YT on Facebook and Instagram for more. And until next time, this is Alien Theory, signing off.